Hi, I'm a white American bear with a jawline that could cut granny. Assigned female at birth, I initially moved through this world internalizing all sorts of horrible narratives about my vagina, and this context made my young bear psyche primed to consume the absolute nonsense that was gender representation in anime. Now that I've matured and incurred an absolute shit ton of educational debt, I've started challenging some of those representations primarily and unfortunately on online forums. Most of the pushback I get for expressing my feminine perspective sounds a little something like this. Well, Japan is just like that, actually. They have really strict gender norms over there, and anime is made for boys anyway, so if you don't like it, why don't you just write your own? And that made me a little sad. So this video, and the channel as a whole, are intended to react to those comments in the best way I know how. With overly philosophical, well-researched, manic word vomit. Let's give it a go. I've chosen to begin this video with a rough review of the history of feminisms in Japan as a way to shine a light on the ongoing struggle for Japanese women's liberation that online forum scholars often neglect to acknowledge happened and is continuing to happen. Critic and journalist for The Baffler, Kate Wagner, whom I recently just learned about, thank you Wisecrack, breaks down four reasons why folks might be peeved about having their favorite media criticized. Personally, I think weebs tend to fall into categories two and four. They'd rather silence than hear criticisms, largely because they don't want to think critically about them, for fear of how they may influence their relationship with their underage waifu. And while I'll further justify my critique later on in this video, I want to bring this up now to help sketch out just how deep this kind of critique could penetrate. While the immediate impact of an uncritical consumption of anime could be misogynist views and an unbridled love for underdogs, as folks immerse themselves deeper and deeper into weeb culture without any critical bubbles of life support, they become vulnerable to harmful conceptions about women, Japan, Japanese women, and Japanese history. It's important to note here that I'm not a scholar of Japan, of Japanese history, or of Japanese feminist thought. I spent my federal loans responsibly and majored in philosophy. I'm merely a bear who knows how to use Google, and I've included a library list in the description below so that you can access the scholarship I've referenced here so that you can learn directly from the people who've actually made it their lives work to catalog these histories. So now, in a semi-chronological order, a nowhere near complete list of influential events and people that impacted feminisms in Japan. Murasaki Shikibu was an 11th century author of famed text The Tale of Genji, thought to be one of the world's first novels, and this is impressive because during this time, women were largely excluded from education. Murasaki Shikibu had a unique position as an outsider in this close-knit aristocratic world. This perspective allowed her to write about this world in a way that few were able to. The text itself, it's deeply ambivalent. And I think that part of the things that makes it so fascinating is that uh, it seems to me to be a, a deep critique of all of this kind of very notion of an idealized style of romance, of you know hierarchy as an end unto itself, this notion of the good life that everybody is clawing their way and backstabbing their way towards. You know, this woman who comes from outside of that system and now has to operate within it um, benefits from it, but is also brutalized by it, I think, has a lot of really critical, I and mean, this is a really strong critical subtext. Kusunose Kita, informally known as Minken Obasan, or the People's Rights Granny, was the first Japanese woman on record to petition for political rights. Widowed without her children in 1874, Kusunose inherited her dead husband's estate and was soon charged taxes for the property. However, at this time, women were not allowed to vote or represent themselves in government, so Kusunose objected this taxation without representation in a move that all red-blooded Americans should stand up and applaud right now. Go on, I will wait. Kusunose's movement received a national attention, and in 1880, a law was passed that enabled localities to drop their own suffrage laws. Soon after, Kusunose's and a few neighboring districts opened a path for women's suffrage. These regulations were the first incidents of women's participation in elections in modern Japanese history, though the law that enabled it was repealed in 1884. The Maiji Constitution, established in 1889, was the first document of its kind outside of Europe and America, and just like its American cousin, depending on which history you believe in, it asserted that civil rights could be limited by law. In 1890 and again in 1900, women were explicitly legally prohibited from joining political parties or attending political events, and under the Civil Code, women were legally subordinated to their male heads of household. Cool. Around the same time, Japan was also doing a bunch of imperialism and stuff, and feminists found solidarity in the rapidly growing socialist movements that united an increasingly disaffected working class around calls for worker and civil rights. Fukuda Hideko was one of such feminist socialists. She found Seiki Fujin, or Women of the World, magazine in 1907 that not only shared socialist literature, but rallied feminists and socialists around the repeal of Japan's oppressive legal codes. The Maiji Constitution is also one of the most prominent examples of de jure sex discrimination in Japan, which explains why a number of Japanese feminists like Fukuda and throughout history are also harsh critics of the nation-state. 
Japanese nationalism and imperial politics have come under harsh scrutiny by Japanese feminist thinkers for their perpetuation of women's oppression through law and military action. Kano Sugako was another socialist, anarcho-feminist journalist and activist who wrote extensively on gender double standards around sexual promiscuity. She's well known for her participation in the 1908 Red Flag incident where activists were imprisoned and beaten after peacefully protesting. This incident was also said to radicalize Kano towards violent revolution. In 1911, she was imprisoned, tortured, and executed by police for her involvement with a socialist plot to murder the emperor along with 25 other activists. Side note, why isn't this an anime? If it is an anime, please drop the link in the comments because I want to watch this anime. This good wife, wise mother phrase that Kano mentions comes from Maiji era belief systems regarding ideal womanhood in East Asia and comes up a lot in the literature, so keep an eye out for it during the video. Ryosai Kenbo is the Japanese term for it. For American history nerds, this is not unlike the Republican motherhood ideology that was circulating during and around the American Revolution. From here on, we'll be looking at thinkers from the first wave or blue stocking era of Japanese feminism, pioneered by the publication of Seito, which emerged as a central hub for Japanese feminist thought. Hiratsuku Raicho was a Japanese writer, journalist, and anarcho-feminist activist who founded the first all-women's literary magazine in Japan, Seito. Like Kano, Hiratsuku rejected the Ryosai Kimbo ideology, critiquing the family structure and comparing traditional Japanese motherhood to becoming a man's lifelong servant and prostitute. Like Fukuda, she used her magazine to uplift ideologies that supported women's liberation and bring together feminist thinkers from across Japan and the world. In the beginning, woman was the sun, an authentic person. Now she is the moon, a wan and sickly moon dependent on another, reflecting another's brilliance. Seito herewith announces its birth. Created by the brains and hands of Japanese women today, it raises its cry like a newborn child. Today, whatever a woman does invites scornful laughter. I know full well what lurks behind this scornful laughter, yet I do not fear it in the least. Is woman so worthless that she brings only nausea? No, an authentic person is not. In the beginning, woman was truly the sun, an authentic person. Now she is the moon, a wan and sickly moon dependent on another, reflecting another's brilliance. The time has come to recapture the sun hidden within us. Ichikawa Fusei was a contemporary of Hiratsuka. Although less sympathetic to anarchism, she collaborated with her to co-found the New Women's Association, or Shin Fujin Kyokai, which was dedicated to expanding women's access to education, employment, and suffrage. In 1922, this organization successfully campaigned for the amendment of Article 5, which forbade women from engaging in politics, though Ichikawa had left the NWA at that point. In 1943, after World War II, Ichikawa formed the New Japan Women's League, which differed drastically from the New Women's Association in that it was not explicitly feminist or socialist. This was a strategic position to take since it enabled the organization to appear less threatening and opened paths to collaboration with the wartime government. Taking advantage of the political tumult of the American post-war occupation, Ichikawa worked in collaboration with the 43rd and 44th Prime Ministers of Japan to propose a bill for women's suffrage, which successfully passed in November of 1945. Now, to be clear, Japan was, again, doing some whack imperialistic shit around this time. War crimes, sexual slavery, and the colonies, just an absolute buffet of atrocity. Ichikawa's willingness to align herself with Japanese politicians at this time was incredibly controversial, and was one of the reasons why her and Hiratsuka moved in different directions. Yoshia Nobuko was a highly prolific Japanese author known for her romance novels that focused on queer and platonic female love and friendship. Another critic of the Rosai Kenbo standard, Yoshia was in a committed same-sex relationship for over 50 years, and is considered to be a pioneer of Japanese lesbian literature. If you're a fan of Yuri, you might be a fan of Yoshia, as many of the tropes in Yuri manga stem from Yoshia's melodramatic yet ambiguous same-sex relationship dynamics. This ambiguity, as well as frequently unhappy endings, saved the works from being censored for their depiction of queer relationships, as lesbianism was pathologized at this time in Japan. Kato Shizue was a contemporary with the blue stocking theorists and fought for broader access to contraception and abortion, but under the ideology of Yosai Kimbo. Kato argued that by giving women control over their reproduction, they would be able to raise better children. In particular, women could create more economically stable homes and better educational environments for their children if they could choose when they were going to have them. Kato was also pro-eugenics, arguing that children born to healthy parents would be better off than if born to ill parents. Given her feminism was less radical than her contemporaries, Kato was able to successfully campaign for a position on the Japanese diet, elected in 1946. Now we're entering into the Uman Ribu, or second wave, era of Japanese feminisms, which in part followed the anarcho-feminist traditions of the blue stocking movement before it, and heavily critiqued earlier feminist collaborations with the wartime government, like Ichikawa's. Quoting from the evolution of the feminist movement in Japan, citation below, 
people began to question and criticize the outcome of the quote-unquote miracle of economic development in the 1960s. People became conscious of the oppressed and exploited. Pollution victims in Minamata, confiscated peasants in San Rezuka, Korean, Japanese, Ainu, Okinawans, and traditionally mistreated outcast Burakumin, all of whom were left behind by the benefits of Japan's modernization. The new wave feminist movement and extension of the counterculture movement protested against the outcome of post-war industrialization. This article also makes a wonderful point about sex discrimination in leftist movements as they were felt by Japanese radical feminists of the time. Marxist revolution was assumed to be the cure-all for any social ill, and thus the woman question was sidelined, a leftist ideological flaw that persists to this day. Tanaka Mitsu was a pioneering activist for Umandibu, establishing the fighting woman group known for their public protests and activism to secure access to safe and legal abortions and contraceptives in Japan. Tanaka firmly believed that women's liberation required sexual liberation and liberation from yosai kenbo, that traditional Japanese family structure we talked about earlier. Tanaka is perhaps most well known for her controversial statements about abortion. One of the other, uh, I think, uh, interesting characteristics of Uman Rib compared to uh, many forms of, for example, in the U.S., um, abortion rights uh, feminist discourse, which um, emphasizes like the individual woman's right to choose. In Japan, their slogan around reproductive justice um, was, uh, you know, let's build a society where women want to give birth. I'll just say that one more time. Let's build a society in which women want to give birth. So it, again, you can see just even in this slogan, it was not about women's individual rights, like political rights per se, that wasn't their focus, but towards really a systemic, uh, large scale change. Um, it was saying we really need to um, uh, look at the entire society and think about what kind of, in what kind of society would people want to give birth as opposed to um, and, and, and making uh, those conditions a reality as opposed to um, focusing on this kind of repressive criminalization. Tanaka departed from public activism in the late 1970s, critiquing the feminist movement for dealing with men on men's terms and adopting academic and masculine attributes and ideologies that drove away rather than called in women. The masculinization effect of feminism that she's referring to, or the belief that women can be liberated by simply acting more like men, can be observed in Western feminist movements as well, typified by girl boss feminism and lean in ideologies, which themselves have come under fire in contemporary discourse. Next up, the 1986 Ordinance for the Enforcement of the Act on Ensuring Equal Opportunities for and Treatment of Men and Women in Employment. <coughs> It's not a person, but was an incredibly significant, albeit small step for gendered employment equality in Japan. The law was harshly criticized by feminists for creating no system of accountability, the two-track employment system that relegated women into positions with little to no opportunities for advancement, and for its focus on maternity benefits, which critics noted aligned too uncomfortably with Rosai Kenbo, perpetuating traditional family structures that oppressed women. Takazato Suzuyo is the founder of the Okinawa Women Against Military Violence Organization, which protests the American military presence in Okinawa. Takazato's work challenges the notion that military force can be enacted to secure peace, and focuses on the history of violence against women conducted by both the Allied Japanese Army and the American Army occupying Okinawa. Speaking against America's military occupation, 53 years is long enough. We have really suffered. Prostitution and rape are the military system's outlets for pent-up aggression and methods of maintaining control and discipline, the target being local community women. Ue no Chizuko, or Japan's best-known feminist, is a Japanese sociological scholar writing on the relationship between capitalism and feminism in Japan. She was a pioneer of the formation of the Academic Gender Studies program in Japan and advocates for making information about Japanese feminism more accessible in order to draw more public engagement with feminist ideas. Her controversial opinions around reproductive rights and monogamy have done just this, provoking public outcry and dialogues around the issues in response. I was often confronted with the Orientalist question, is there such a thing as a feminism in Japan? Yes, there was, and there is, and there will be. Finally, Margot Okazawa Rei is a Japanese feminist educator and activist, known best as a founding member of the Kambahi River Collective, a black feminist socialist organization of scholars that employed intersectional theory to articulate the failings of white feminism and civil rights movements at addressing the needs of black lesbians. Okazawa Rei is half African American and Japanese, a mixed race heritage that she notes is only possible because of the American military occupation of Japan. Her research expands on this heritage as she examines the influence of militarism and armed conflict on violence against women globally, demonstrating the transnational applications of socialist feminism. So, to summarize, Japan isn't just like that. Like the US, Japan has a history of gender discrimination that's been institutionalized into the culture. And many men and women throughout Japanese history have devoted their lives to combating not only those norms, but the nationalist and imperialist cultural norms that are intersectionally bound up with them. 
And if that's the case, why don't we see more anime that challenge oppressive norms, that explore the cultural and ideological diversity of Japan in a colorful shonen underdog arc? I mean, who's more of an underdog than a Japanese feminist? But before we explore that, a word from our sponsor. Are you an entrepreneur? Have you reached total saturation over your domestic market but still yearn for profit? Then I'm delighted to tell you about this week's sponsor, Global Capitalism. Take your product around the world with Global Capitalism. International consumers will be in awe of your incredible, edible, ethnic ambiguity. And don't worry, Global Capitalism works hard to tailor your product to the exact specifications of the population they're targeting to ensure maximal loss of all cultural context and maximum consumability, whether you consent to it or not. Yummy! Warning, side effects of global capitalism will definitely include xenophobia, fetishization, orientalism, cultural imperialism, cultural essentialism, and just the gnarliest fan fiction you've ever read. If you experience any of these side effects, don't call anybody. Absolutely zero systems of accountability exist in this shit. There's literally nothing we can do. So try global capitalism today and make more money. In the 1960s, around the same time Uman Libu was kicking off, a tiny little round-headed child soldier was broadcasting directly into the hearts and minds of American families. His name was Adam, but that was way too controversial for the Cold War era consumer market, so NBC decided to rename him Astro Boy! Astro Boy! 104 of the original 193 episodes were localized and broadcast in the U.S. to great fanfare. Unfortunately, popularity for the show declined as color television pushed the black and white animated TV show out of the zeitgeist. It wouldn't be until the 1980s that animations from Japan began to creep back into the American markets, only this time they weren't being distributed by NBC. As profiled by Crunchyroll and Yudoya Travis in the Anime in America podcast series, the real proof of concept for an American anime market came in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Anime had established itself as an art form in 1988 with the widely distributed and acclaimed release of Katsuhiro Otomo's Akira, and American audiences were thirsty for more. But remember, this was pre-internet, so accessing international media was quite difficult. When they couldn't find it on their televisions, they sought out international connections, either ordering Laserdiscs directly from Japan or getting VHS rips from American military members stationed in Okinawa. Funny how both anime in America and black Japanese socialist feminism both have ties back to the American military occupation. Travis then highlights how collegiate anime clubs exploited their access to high-tech AV equipment to burn subtitles into imported tapes of shows, copied them, and then sent them out to friends and fans. The tapes that got the most circulation were shown in anime, despite some of the successful shoujo being subbed and circulated. By the 2000s, anime was emerging as a profitable market in the US again, thanks to the popularity of Pokemon, Dragon Ball, Yu-Gi-Oh, and of course... <laughs> Oh, wait, no, that, sorry, sorry, that was just me. As technology advanced, fan subbed copies of anime were able to be subbed and distributed entirely online, forming the scaffolds of the digital anime distribution networks we know and love today. It's worth noting that the population of folks that began sneaking anime into the U.S. back in the 80s and 90s have remained the target demographic for anime distribution in the U.S. to this day, young and college-aged men. Even the shows that reinvigorated the anime markets here in the U.S., like Dragon Ball and Beat, Pokemon, and more recently Demon Slayer and My Hero Academia are shown in series with male protagonists, and actually, this may have been by design. Orientalism, a term coined by Palestinian-American author Edward Said, refers to the phenomena of Western creators, authors, and theorists generating imagined and often derogatory conceptualizations of Eastern cultures or characters. While Said was referring primarily to Western conceptualizations of Middle Eastern cultures in his text, his concept has been broadly employed to critique how the West represents any non-Western culture in its media. A branch of thought that came out of Said's Orientalism is the concept of self-Orientalism, or how non-Western cultures distill down and package specific representations of themselves for Western consumption. One such example emerged right around the same time as our college boy friends were burning those VHS subs. Even though cultural exports from Japan had already proliferated overseas, it wasn't until the Cool Japan Initiative started in the 1980s that the Japanese government saw the potential value of an international market. Cool Japan was a soft power media initiative that paid careful attention to how Western audiences perceived of Japan. By the 2000s, media franchises like Pokemon and Hello Kitty were proving to be not only highly profitable, but highly powerful at influencing Western markets' perceptions of the country. And it was basically an initiative spearheaded by the Japanese government to sort of repaint the image of Japan, uh, which America had become super afraid of in the 1980s and when the bubble period like popped. Uh, they weren't afraid of Japan anymore, so Japan was like, okay, so we can reinvent our image to make it look more palatable to Westerners in the form of uh, cultural exports like anime, manga, video games, music. Like, when I was living in America, um, 
mid 2000s. Manga was everywhere. Uh, Deer and Grey was on MTV. J Rock was on MTV. Anime Expo had like half a million people going to it every year. People really cared about this, like、uh, this sort of cool Japan, right? And what it propagates. And it did get a lot of people interested in, you know, like Japanese culture and cultural exports. But at the same time,、uh, it has effectively washed away or pushed aside facets of history that have continued to affect media for generations. Japan was no longer a violent imperialist nation known for provoking American involvement in World War II, but instead the home of Naruto and Pikachu. And the Japanese government had a vested interest in keeping up those appearances. Enough interest, in fact, to found the Creative Industries Promotion Office in 2010 with the explicit intent of collaborating with private industries to uphold the cool Japan image. So, worth noting here is that around this time in American culture, we were in our post feminist era. Series like Sex in the City and Friends were dominating the ratings, helping white American women see that they, like men, were people capable of having sex and being employed. All the while, Perez Hilton and TMZ were profiting off the demonization of young starlets as tabloid media, following post 9 11 American surveillance trends, decided that young women in Hollywood didn't have privacy rights. The going assumption was that if women wanted to be and were sexually liberated, then it must be the case that women wanted to be seen that way. And since this is what women wanted, tabloids had every right to sexualize and objectify women in the name of supporting sexual liberation. And while fictionalized versions of female sexuality usually featured the fun best friend that helped women get over any misogyny or backlash with a witty quip, the real stories of sexualized women in this era. Demonstrate just how horrific, invasive, and traumatizing this backlash was. And this is about where I come in. Internalizing everything that particular media landscape was telling me about how bald Britney was bad, but culturally appropriating stoic Justin Timberlake was good. And guess what medium just so happened to perpetuate a lot of those exact same themes? I mean, hypersexualized female bodies existing in hyper masculine spaces, it's almost like the American media landscape was made for anime at this moment. So it's no wonder that these shows exploded in popularity. They were speaking directly to the American zeitgeist, and the American zeitgeist lapped it up. All this is to say that intersectional and radical feminisms exist and have existed in Japan, but you don't see those perspectives when you watch anime, because anime is a capitalist product that was written and designed to profit off of Japanese cultural mores, which have been historically shaped by patriarchal Japanese nationalism. Additionally, as a global capitalist cultural export, those themes and mores as they emerge in anime become objects for consumption, unintentionally or sometimes explicitly intentionally detached from their Japanese context. Viewed from white America! They're interpreted through American cultural mores, and if you're not tapped into intersectional feminist discourses, chances are you're gonna be quite entertained. Many of the themes in shonen anime don't have to be localized. Male fan subbers cherry picked the media they most desired to see translated and primed the pump for a shonen centric anime market in the US. Japanese cultural exporters saw what consumers were consuming and made sure that their consumables appeased those Western cravings. These themes easily mapped onto American white capitalist cis hat patriarchy, and hell, even the character's skin was light enough to be racially misinterpreted as white. Today, because of localization and persistent cis hat patriarchal norms, we're still less likely to see feminist representation in anime in America because. Because the market here is just as small as the market for it in Japan, especially in a post Trump, post post feminist media landscape where white men are desperate for any art form that allows them to imagine themselves on top rather than losing control over the food chain. The cost of translation and importation makes it a near zero sum game for production companies to pursue these revolutionary narratives. Why do you think incredible shows like Stars Align, Twelve Kingdoms, March Comes In Like a Lion, Chiha Ya Furu, etc., 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 are all cancelled before they reach the end of their run? And side note, please everyone go watch Skip and Loafer right now. I can't have this show canceled after one season. It's so fucking good. Please just stop the video right now and go watch it. It's on Crunchyroll. It's so good. Please go watch it now. I'm a white American bear with a vagina and an incredibly chiseled jawline. I hold a lot of radical ideological stances, and even though there are a number of credible philosophical problems with applying Western intersectional feminism as an analytical framework for Japanese media, through this channel, I'm asserting my privilege as a white American by doing so anyway. By employing these frameworks and engaging in critique, I'm engaging with the art as a consumable product, as it might be interpreted by a Western, but particularly American, white male audience. Although I am divorcing the product from its Japanese cultural context, in doing so, I'm making the assumption that Joe Six Pack American anime consumers are doing the same thing. We're both using our American discourses to interpret and map art onto our own experience. And because of our white American capitalist cis het patriarchy, one of our experiences maps on a lot more generously than the other. That said, when each of us Americans goes out and engages in the world, we're engaging in an American cultural context, not a Japanese one. In this context, we have leverage to change or perpetuate American cultural norms. So when a 12 year old bear watches anime like I did back in the day, they're generating the social conceptions of the world that they're living in from that show. They're internalizing narratives about their own identity as they see it in that. Show, and it's for that reason that I'm creating this channel. 
Under this framework, the fact that Japanese feminisms exist at all isn't relevant because American feminisms exist. But I'm trying to do my due diligence to disrupt cultural essentialist narratives of Japan by introducing them because they do exist. It's not justifiable, however, to essentialize Japanese feminisms or any other element of Japanese culture for the sake of my argument. This critique is for Americans, by an American, and so I'm going to rely heavily on American feminisms and philosophies for my critiques. It just so happens that the product being interrogated came from Japan. It is a radically thin line to walk, but look at me here, look at me go. So who is this channel for? This is not a channel intended to shit on Japan, Japanese creators, Japanese people, or Japanese cultures. This is not a channel intended to shit on anime fans for being fans of a genre with an ongoing history of problematic portrayals of a whole host of communities. This is not a channel intended to make you feel bad for liking anime because, comrade, I fucking love anime. I love it so much. To interpolate a quote from the great James Baldwin, I love anime more than any other content in the world, and exactly for this reason, I insist on the right to criticize her perpetually. This is a channel intended to help anime fans who've maybe never thought about this stuff wake up to some of the problematic themes their favorite media perpetuates for the communities they're a part of or existing adjacent to. This is a channel intended to honor the legacies of radical Japanese feminisms and challenge narratives of Japanese cultural essentialism that have historically dominated Western anime discourses. But most of all, this is a channel intended to help anime fans who, like me, might have been ostracized from the fandom for their identities or ideas, and hopefully open a path for fellow radicals to congregate, share thoughts, and just relish in their collective love for this absolutely gorgeous, incredibly engaging, magically magnetic, animated art form. Next time on Dragon Ball Z.